Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod Sleep Stories. My name is Laura. Today, we will relax with a retelling of the classic romance novel, Sense and Sensibility. We will experience love in London and follow the tale of three sisters finding their place in the world. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the space that we are in. Take a deep breath and allow yourself to sink into the mattress. Close your eyes and breathe in for one, two, three, four. Hold that breath for one, two, three, four, five, six. And now exhale for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Continue to follow this pattern as you grow closer and closer to relaxation. With your eyes closed, allow your imagination to wander. Picture a candle sitting on a windowsill. What is the weather like outside that window? Is it raining? Or foggy? Or perhaps it is a clear summer night? Is that candle against the windowsill long and tall? Or perhaps it's short, shielded by a glass container of some kind? Picture the colour of the candle. Is it white? Green? Or maybe even black? Does your candle have a smell that is unique to just your candle and your candle alone? Does it smell of pine trees after a long rain? Maybe it smells of lilacs and lupins that stretch as far as the eye can see. Whatever scent your candle is, when you inhale, imagine the freshness and comfort of that scent filling your whole body. Inhale and relish in that scent as you hold your breath Picture the candle flickering slightly, calming you as that breath heals you. Now as you exhale, feel the relief fill your body. Your relaxed breath is filling the room with an atmosphere of peace and belonging. Once more, Breathe in the scent of your candle and hold that breath as your candle flickers gently in front of the window pane. Exhale that peace and belonging out into your room and into the world. Wherever you go, know that you carry that scene with you. You will always have your cabin in the woods or your penthouse above the city or your home in a quiet suburb with that candle on the windowsill. If you find your mind wandering or find any negative feelings creeping up, know that you can return to this place and find comfort in it. Now that we've taken the time to relax, let us begin. 
The rain had hardly seemed to stop the entire ride to Barton Cottage in Devonshire. Marianne, Eleanor, and Margaret gazed out of the carriage window with a kind of listless energy that had followed them since they left Norland Park. In fact, since long before they left Norland Park. Norland Park had been their home for nearly their whole lives. They had lived in harmony with their father, Henry Dashwood, their mother, Mrs. Dashwood, and Henry's wealthy uncle, who owned the brilliant estate. It had been the kind of home any sound person would dream of. There were three stories filled to the brim with solid mahogany furniture and oil paintings that had the ability to transport you to a different world entirely. The grounds were comprised of sprawling evergreen lawns and gardens full of roses, tulips, and sunflowers. As children, Margaret, Eleanor, and Marianne had spent almost all their days lounging in the garden, under umbrellas, eating delicious snacks, and whispering secrets as they wandered through their own personal fairy tale land. Truly, their lives had been perfect there. They roamed the halls and the gardens with a sense of belonging that many people search their whole lives for. But soon, that changed. When their beloved father, Mr. Dashwood, and his uncle passed, unfortunately for the women, the estate wasn't passed down to Mrs. Dashwood and the children. With a keen sense of optimism, Marianne had promised her sisters that nothing would change when John, Henry's son from another marriage, took over the estate. John had promised their father on his deathbed that he would care for Mrs. Dashwood and the girls for the rest of their lives. But unfortunately, his wife, Fanny, had not made that same promise. When Fanny and John arrived at the house, Mrs. Dashwood and the girls had called home for nearly their entire lives. It became obvious that they were unwanted. Fanny's jealousy bled into everything and was only worsened when her brother, Edward, came to visit. Edward sat in the study with Eleanor for long hours, discussing literature and current events as rain pitter-pattered against the stained glass window panes. Fanny could see the admiration in Eleanor's eyes. She saw the way Eleanor clung to every word that Edward said, as though it was poetry. But Fanny also knew she couldn't have a brother of hers marrying one of the Dashwoods. The situation became so fraught that Mrs. Dashwood and the girls had to find another place to live, which is precisely how they found themselves in a carriage winding through the rainy streets of London on one Saturday afternoon. They knew Barton Cottage would be an adequate home for them. It was a two-story stone building in the countryside, surrounded by tall willow and oak trees that had stories to tell. And when they arrived, the girls were not disappointed. 
Marianne, ever the romantic, looked out over the vibrant green estate with visions of long, intimate walks around the property and evenings spent by the warm chimney. Eleanor, on the other hand, was already thinking of how they could live within their means in this smaller yet adequate home. It would be far less to maintain than Norwood Estates. But it was missing something. Every time she thought of Edward, she tried to shake him from her mind. Edward was a sensible man, responsible and entirely sure of himself. When he had talked about his view of the world and his hopes for the future, Eleanor found herself more drawn to him by the second. But now, he was far away, long gone and wrapped in a world she didn't think she would ever see again. With her family and future in mind, Eleanor returned her focus to the matters at hand. Though the longing in her heart to speak with Edward again would stir at the strangest of times. Upon their arrival at the new estate, they were greeted by Sir John, Mrs. Dashwood's cousin, his wife and a friend, Colonel Brandon. The group sat in the parlour around the fireplace, discussing the new town. It breathed more life and hope into the girls. And to their surprise, their arrival seemed to breathe new life into Colonel Brandon. He was an older bachelor, responsible and self-assured, but clearly wanting for more. Clearly wanting someone to be by his side, to encourage him, to love him in a way he hadn't been loved in quite some time. As the conversation continued well into the night, it became rather obvious that his affections and hopes for the future fell on none other than Marianne. Just looking at her, he felt a kind of hope that he hadn't ever felt before. He admired the passion in her eyes and in her words as she spoke. The way she talked with her hands and with such love of the world drew him closer and closer. He loved her untethered nature the trueness she had to herself, and her own emotions. By the time Colonel Brandon, Sir John, and his wife had left, Eleanor and Margaret were itching to tease Marianne about the bachelor with clear feelings for her. Marianne brushed their comments off. She had long dreamt of a life filled with romance. She would find a handsome, young bachelor, one with brilliant ideas about the world and nothing but love and admiration for her. He would sweep her off her feet, never thinking of anything but her and their life together. Love was something that fueled Marianne. It was something that gave her life meaning, and her desire to find that with the right person fueled almost everything she did. The following morning, Marianne awoke rather early. The moor was awash in a thick layer of fog. In the nearby forests, she could hear the birds shaking off their slumber and slowly awakening to a world cloaked 
in that refreshing blanket that filled the air with the aroma of pines and dripping wild flowers. Even with her window only propped open an inch, Marianne was invigorated by the refreshing morning air. She stepped out of her warm bed and onto the cool floor, slid on her nicest clothes and slipped out into the morning air before a soul even knew she was awake. The world was full of potential to Marianne, and the potential could be found even on simple mornings like this, before the rest of the world was awake. The rain fell in a slow, steady drizzle, almost as if it was transforming to mist the moment it became entangled with the fog. As Marianne walked, she could feel the cool, refreshing touch of the raindrops kiss her skin, urging her to enjoy the day even more. She closed her eyes on occasion, taking the time to take deep, satisfying breaths of that fresh air. She breathed in for one, two, three, four, and held the breath, savoring the aroma of the cedars, shimmering birch trees, and long rolling meadows. As she exhaled, she felt the tension in every muscle melt away and slink into the puddles around her feet. There was more of a spring in her step now. She had already begun to embrace the potential of this morning. But little did she know how much potential was just around the corner. Marianne took a particularly springy step, fueled by the feelings of joy and belonging that was swaying in her body with every bound she took. But the ground, washed away and muddled by the rainfall and layer of fog, gave way. Marianne found herself tumbling down a hill rolling over and over and over with increasing speed. When she finally came to a stop, she gazed up at the grey sky, trying to ground herself. Her ankle had twisted in the mud, and simply putting an ounce of pressure on it sent uncomfortable feelings racing up her ankle. Normally, Marianne was apt to laugh at her own mistakes. But in this situation, she found herself a little less optimistic than most. My lady, are you hurt? A deep, rich voice rang through the fog. Marianne sat up, her cheeks flushing a deep red. She had hardly met any of the men in this town, and what a way this would be to meet one. From the fog, a man, John Willoughby, emerged. He was utterly handsome, the kind of handsome that stopped Marianne's heart almost immediately. His blue eyes seemed to cut through the fog like a beacon. His dark brown hair, fell in damp curls around his face, highlighting his high cheekbones and plush lips. But it wasn't just his handsome appearance that filled Marianne with admiration. It was the concern shining in those cerulean blue eyes. He knelt by her side 
gently placing a hand on her shoulder. Are you hurt? He repeated, his voice softer this time. Marianne nodded in a dreamy state. It's my ankle, she replied. Do I have your permission to ascertain if there are any breaks? He asked. Marianne gave him permission. Still trying to make sense of the situation that she had found herself in. With a tender touch, John removed her shoe. He gently lifted her foot, supporting her ankle with his other hand. Please, if this hurts too much, inform me and I will stop. His voice was like honey. Marianne nodded breathlessly as he began to softly rotate her foot in a circle. After which, he glanced up with a slight smile. It's not broken. Now would you mind wrapping your arm around my neck? He slid her shoe back on with a kind of care Marianne had never seen from a man before. She wrapped her arm around the back of his neck. He scooped her up into his arms drawing her head against his shoulder. His left arm cradled her lower back, ensuring that she wouldn't be dropped. Once she was securely in place, the two paused for a single moment. Their eyes met. Their faces were inches apart. Marianne had never been this close to a man before. She'd never been held by a man before, nor cared for by someone in this way. As they gazed into each other's eyes for that split moment, Marianne felt warmth and admiration wash over her like a gentle wave. She was transfixed by him, mesmerized by him, just from the simple looks they exchanged. And John, he felt the same. Holding Marianne in his arms felt unlike anything he had ever experienced before. He had a longing to draw her closer, to protect her from the pain she carried and any pain that existed out in the world. He carried Marianne up the hill with careful, deliberate steps. Marianne could feel her cheeks flush, contrasting with the icy cold touch of the rain. What a fool I am for running in the rain, Marianne muttered. John smiled softly at her. Were you chasing blue skies? He asked. Well, I know they are out there somewhere, Marianne replied, a sweet smile lacing her face. The rest of the walk through the damp landscape, the two were mostly silent. Every once in a while, Marianne felt John's fingers tighten ever so slightly on her sides, as if they were trying to make sure she was secure and safe. Every time he tightened his grip on her, Marianne couldn't resist stealing a glance at him. The rain poured over his angular face, dripping off the tip of his nose and his dark curly locks with every step that he took. He looked utterly human to her, vulnerable and real not like the men she saw at galas and other events. Finally, they found themselves outside of Barton Cottage. Immediately upon entering, Mrs. Dashwood raced to the door, surprised to find her daughter in the grasp of a dashing gentleman. Concerned, she asked her daughter what had happened. After Marianne explained, 
John gently set her down on the couch. I took the liberty of checking the bone, and it's not broken. She simply twisted it. As he spoke, every woman in the room gave him their full attention. Thank you. Thank you for caring for her, Mrs. Dashwood said, as she hovered around Marianne, fluffing pillows and ensuring her comfort. I am honoured to be of service. Permit me to come tomorrow afternoon and inquire about her safety, he asked politely. The girls exchanged a look, excitement glowing in their eyes. That would be lovely, thank you, Mrs. Dashwood responded. John smiled and put his hat back on, making his way back out into the rain. He gave Marianne one final look before he slipped into the hallway. His name, his name, Eleanor muttered, tugging urgently at her mother's dress. Mrs. Dashwood scurried after John. Might we get your name, good sir? John Willoughby, at your service, madame. And with those words, he slipped out the door. The girls sat by the fire for quite some time, talking of John. Marianne, completely enamoured, spoke of his spirit and wit, the way he conducted himself in such a mature manner. He lifted me as though I was nothing more than a dried leaf, she recounted. Her heart pitter-pattering with the memory of his touch. When John returned the next day, their romance truly began. The two spoke at length about music, poetry and art. As they spoke, listening to one another, and the rain on the window pane, they found themselves drawn closer and closer together. Like Marianne, John was a romantic. He spoke in hushed, honey-sweet tones about his view of love and happiness. As the weeks went on, Marianne and John grew inseparable. Marianne greatly admired his dashing looks and dreamy ideas. Their secretive manner led to whispers among Eleanor and Mrs. Dashwood. They believed the two were secretly engaged. In private, Eleanor urged Marianne to guard her heart. But Marianne did not heed her words. She was madly in love, and logic did not factor into manners of the heart for her. Soon, John was whisking away Marianne for private time away from the family, where they would talk about the future. Marianne thought things couldn't get any more lovely. And then, John asked for a lock of her hair, a keepsake that he would honour and admire. Marianne obliged. She held her breath as John gently snipped a piece of her hair and tucked it away for safekeeping. Her heart swelled with the realisation that soon a proposal was coming. John came to the house late one afternoon, dressed in fine clothes. He joined Marianne alone in the study, just outside the mahogany doors. The family waited, expecting to hear the news of a proposal. But, to their surprise, Marianne emerged from the room in tears. She watched out the window as John disappeared over the horizon on horseback. 
she revealed to her family that John was to go to London on business indefinitely. Her first love was gone. For several weeks, Marianne carried heartbreak with her everywhere she went. When she and Eleanor were offered a trip to London by Mrs. Jennings, she gleefully accepted, hoping to reunite with her love. At a dance one evening in the city, Marianne finally met eyes with John again, only to find him on the arm of Miss Gray, a wealthy young woman. That evening, Marianne discovered the truth. John had become engaged to Miss Gray. Distraught and heartbroken, Marianne left the party and hurried into the streets of London, fighting the heavy emotions she was carrying. She mourned his loss at home for several weeks, fearing that the great love of her life was gone. She had never experienced a feeling so strong. Deep down, she wondered if she would ever experience it again. One day, she opened the door to find Colonel Brandon arriving for a visit. Noticing her distance and the sadness in her eyes, he asked Marianne what had brought her to a place of such sorrow. Marianne found herself vulnerable with Colonel Brandon. She explained the loss she experienced in great detail, and Brandon hung onto every word, an understanding gleam in his eyes. Later, Brandon took Eleanor aside in private. I tell you this in hopes of relieving Marianne's sorrow, in hopes of giving her unfortunate situation some finality. John Willoughby seduced my young ward, Eliza. He left her pregnant and alone, with no hesitation. He is a man of passion, not a man of care, nor of love. It pained Brandon to tell Eleanor the truth, but he knew it was for the best. Though he and Marianne didn't share a passion or an initial spark, he had grown to care deeply for her. When she was in the room, he felt lighter. After learning this news, Marianne was even more distraught. She and Eleanor travelled to another country estate with Mrs. Jennings, hoping to find some comfort. Still aching with her loss, Marianne escaped into the meadows for an afternoon. But as rain started to fall, Marianne had no desire to get inside. The coldness of the rain the power of the wind. They made her feel grounded. They separated her from her loss. But soon, the cold was too much. She fell to her knees in the rain, her body frail and exhausted. Through the rain, however, a familiar shape emerged. Brandon hurried to her side, concern dripping from every movement he made. Are you hurt, Marianne? he asked. He found himself placing his hand on her cheek, desperate to look in her eyes and make sure she was safe. Marianne returned the gaze, her eyes brimming with tears. I need to get inside, she replied, her voice quivering. Brandon wrapped himself around Marianne, taking her gently in his arms. He cradled her, tightening his hands around her waist and back, 
to make sure she was protected, to make sure she was safe. We will get you inside and set you by the fire, my dear. We'll get you some sleep and some warm tea. And perhaps I'll read some of your favorites to you. You mustn't fret. I have got you. Brandon brushed wet hair from her face as he muttered this quiet promise to her. Upon getting her home, Marianne fell gravely ill. Brandon read to her and cared for her, hardly ever leaving her side. When Marianne finally awakened, her mother was by her side. She told Marianne of everything that had transpired while she was struggling. John had come to visit her. He spoke of his love for Marianne and spoke disdainfully of his new wife and of Brandon's ward. His character truly showed in the conversation. He was indeed a man of passion, but not one of care. Marianne realized a man of care would be by her side. He would speak to her with respect, but treat her with respect also. He would make his feelings clear. As the thought crossed her mind, her eyes drifted up to Brandon. For the next few weeks, the two sat in the garden together, reading poetry and growing closer. Marianne felt feelings of love she had never experienced. Not young love. Not love driven by passion. Love in its fullest form. Soon, Marianne and Brandon were married. Their ceremony was one of joy. But Eleanor, too, found her happily ever after. After finally being reunited with Edward, the two wed, buying an estate right next to Marianne and Brandon. The four lived brilliant lives in harmony with one another. They lived surrounded by real love, true love, and they never wanted for anything else. I hope you've enjoyed this classic tale, and it has helped lead you to a place of sleepy comfort. Please join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. <laughs>